my brother and I made a pact. One, we will never get married and we will never have kids. It wasn't because we hated our parents or anything, although my brother and I do have some sort of weird relationship with our father, who I fondly refer to as Bio Dad. <laughs> That name at least allows him the space to be a hero and a villain at any time he could swoop in and he could either save me or really fuck shit up in my life. But I think the point is that he doesn't do either. He just, he's just kind of out there doing his thing. And I know now that we're all okay with that, but it was something that my brother and I bonded a lot over during our childhood and even still now. Just last year, my brother and his wife came up with a new nickname for him because he accidentally to start, started to sign my brother's birthday card, Roger, his real name, and ended up with Rad, and we all laughed a lot about it. <laughs> and my mom, well, she was and is everything to us. She had full custody of us and loved us every freaking minute of our lives, and I know I'm so fucking privileged in that way. And I know she always struggled working class style to provide for us, and I know now that she struggled in ways that none of us ever knew about until more recently when she had her schizophrenic break. From my perspective, she was the bee's knees, the cat's pajamas, the light of the lightning bug, and the best parts of Peachy. And I'm sure my brother thought so too. So the pack didn't have anything to do with my parents. We were just being brother and tomboy sister together. Well really, we were being brother and queer sister together but no one called me that. They just called me a tomboy sister. You know, playing in the woods, practicing formal wrestling moves on each other in the living room, me accidentally sticking a fishing hook all the way through his pinky, <laughs> him saving my life from elect electrocution, and me still blaming him for everything. Which is actually more of a little sibling thing than a tomboy queer sister thing, but you know, all the regular tomboy stuff. I grew up never thinking I was going to get married and have kids. I never wanted that, and maybe my brother did, but just didn't know it yet, or maybe he didn't, but he grew up and changed like people do. But for me, at that time, it was impossible for me to imagine marriage and kids in my little brain. I already knew at a very young age that I wanted to be with women. You know, be with women in that very special, sexy, 80s, idealized, little mermaid love kind of way. <laughs> Even though Ursula was actually my favorite character in that movie. <laughs> Needless to say, I saw no role models for LGBTQ folks in the 1980s in my small rural world in northern Indiana. There was no internet, there was no cable TV, no cell phones, just a VCR, free channels, the farm fields, and the woods. The closest village to us with a flashing light was at least a 20 minute drive from my house in Walkerton. <laughs> so I knew holding up my end of our no marriage, no kids pack was going to be easy. Because in Walkerton, gays, lesbians, bi's, trans, queers, we're demons. We're figments of people's imagination. We didn't really exist, and if we did, we typically got the hell out of there as soon as possible, or died trying. Really, died. Those silent deaths, suicide, self-destruction, hate crimes that are never reported as hate crimes, and we surely didn't breed. Getting married, having kids were not on my list of top priorities in life. School was because it was a way out and maybe love. In 2007, there I was at my brother's wedding with my partner of several years who was six months pregnant with my baby. Hell yeah, I kind of know how to get a girl pregnant. <laughs> but my brother was getting married and I was having a kid, so at the reception, we drank to the pack being out the window. And three months later, Phineas Victor graced this world with his joyful presence, and I'm so thankful for him every day. In October of that same year, after California decided to allow the gays to marry, my partner and I just decided to bite the bullet and get married. Then they passed Proposition 8 that said that same-sex couples couldn't marry, but we were already married, 
and whatever political forces that were involved were appealing the decision and blah, 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 blah. But in the meantime, my marriage, or maybe my not marriage, my relationship was slowly deteriorating. I wasn't the, it wasn't the most solid relationship to begin with, but I can really only say that in retrospect, right? Because at the time, it seemed okay. That's what we all say at the time. And the pressures of new parenthood were wielding their vicious forces during those first few months of being parents, what I call the baby days, D-A-Z-E, because you're so sleep deprived that you feel like your days blend together and, is, and Salvador Dali is painting your life. <laughs> we were trying to relearn how to live the daily with a new baby being in the mix. And my partner was in this postpartum trying to fit, find her way back to her own body. I can't even fathom that, but I really wanted to respect it. So we opened our marriage to allow her to find her sexiness again. And I really wanted to say that is what led to the slow depletion of our connection and our commitment to each other. But in therapy during the throes of all of this, she admitted to not loving me even before we got pregnant. Mind fuck much? That made me question my own judgment, life, and everything in between. I retreated from the world like a turtle recoiling. I was just trying to hold shit together with our home and with our kid. Slowly but surely, she found her way to someone else. By the time the federal courts were hearing the appeals of Prop 8 in 2011 and 12, I was secretly rooting for them to rule that our marriage was not valid simply because I didn't want to have to get a divorce. <laughs> I was literally sitting at work watching the ticker of the live courtroom feed, sneaking peeks between phone calls and emails, almost as if I was live streaming March Madness day games. <laughs> Which is funny and not funny, right? Because there are a lot of us who never wanted to put all that goddamn money and effort behind the whole marriage fight in the first place, not because we don't want to be able to do it, but because we can still get fired for even being suspected of being LGBTQ in a lot of states. So shouldn't we really be fighting for job protections? Or how about that there are so many LGBTQ folks that are homeless that it hurts and it's shameful. But there I was, rooting for selfish reasons, not even the good ones, that Prop 8 be upheld. I know, I'm awful, it felt awful, I felt guilty and shameful, and for the first time in my life, I found myself empathizing with my bio dad. It would have been so easy to just pick up and leave as a non-birthing parent and as a non-bio parent. The empathy for my bio dad was pounding like the relentless rhythms of the ocean waves on a windy day. Because when your life is so enmeshed with someone and there's a child involved, there's this kind of separation and reimagining of living and being and a different kind of commitment to working with someone to raise a child separately, but together. It kind of sucks me working your whole life. I'm not, war I'm not wired like my bio dad, and I, I would never leave my son, and he is my son. And there is a reward to work through it and figure it out that that reward is loving and knowing your kid. Although I understood why my bio dad bowed out, I was still pissed that he did. And I was really pissed that I had to figure out how to be a mommy only half time, when the only role model I had for a mom was an amazingly present full-timer. My relationship with my son has always been solid. From the moment I first saw a glimpse of his head coming out of his mama's vagina, he has been my tether to this earth. And I can't believe it has been nine years since he was born. And I can't believe I'm a single butch mommy, but I am, and I love it. I never, went, <laughs> I never went into having a child thinking I would only have him half the time, and that has been the hardest thing for me to adjust to. The hardest, probably meanest, worst anger I've worked through and let go of. And although my son can't rem can remember my ex-partner and I living in the same house, he can't remember that we ever shared a bedroom, and that's okay, but it kills me when he says things like, Mommy, when I grow up, I'm gonna have my kids on Mondays and Tuesdays like you. <laughs> it kills me though, because how do you explain that to a nine-year-old? So I told him, you know, when I decided to have you, I thought I was going to see you and be with you all the time. That's what I wanted. 
but now that your mom and I don't live together, we have to make sure that each of us gets to see you the same amount of time because we both love you so much. But if you ever have kids, you need to expect to have them all the time. <laughs> I could talk all night about our cuddle puddles on the couch, watching Wheel of Fortune, about how every Tuesday we get a donut on the way to school, about how he likes to wiggle his butt when he walks down the hallway, but the truth is there are so many amazingly beautiful moments that it's important for me to just enjoy him and be present with him, just like my mom did with my brother and I. So that pact my brother and I made was hogwash. We both outgrew it. I made that pact thinking marriage wasn't for me, and maybe it still isn't, but not for the same reason anymore. And I made that pact before knowing that the joy of having a child has a way of grounding you in the present like no other force I found on the planet. And before knowing that time is so precious, and before knowing that no matter how much we plan, want, desire, or promise ourselves this or that, life can never be exactly like we think it's gonna be. 